Well, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I hope you like my uh, painting of uh, Jeff Bridges. He's my favorite actor, so I want to give a little love to Jeff Bridges tonight. And uh, actually, one thing that I really appreciate about uh, you guys is the uh, opportunity to let me come and do the thing that I love the most, which is to paint and preach. So my name is Cody, and I'm from uh, a township called North Huntington on the southeast side of Pittsburgh. Some of you guys might be familiar with it. It's about 15 minutes south of Monroeville. So uh, I still live out there. Um, and yes, I work out in Robinson, which means my drive through two tunnels is always a, a stressful period of time. Uh, if you guys can do me a favor, since we're all part of this Pittsburgh uh, community, can you guys please, when we approach the tunnel, there's signs everywhere. I feel like I shouldn't have to explain this. There's signs that say maintain speed. And what that means is when you're driving down 376, about 10 miles an hour or more over the speed limit, maintain that. Keep going because I'll tell you what, my commute Monday through Friday is about an hour and 15 minutes. So if you guys could maintain that speed, that would be great. Uh, I went to Norwin High School on that side of the state, and then I went to Kentucky Christian University, which is uh, the same school that Brandon Stevenson went to, John Fisher, uh, all these guys that sort of, uh, you know, migrated up north back to Pittsburgh. Uh, so we, um, if you, you know, like the way Brandon preaches, hopefully, uh, hopefully you do, because that's the same way that we have been taught, and hopefully it works out just as well. But I want to start off with a story for you guys, a story uh, that that I had read about this, uh, this thing that happens, uh, this thing that happened in India. See, it says here, uh, a water bearer in India had two large pots, each hung on each uh, end of the pole, which he carried across his neck, and one of the pots had a crack in it. Uh, while the other pot was, was perfect, of course, and always delivered this full portion of water at the end of the long walk from the stream to the master's house. The cracked pot only arrives half full. For two years, this went on daily, this, this perfect pot delivering the full portion and the cracked pot delivering half a pot of water. And the perfect pot was was proud, was proud of his accomplishments because he's doing what he was made to do. But the poor uh, crackpot was ashamed of its own imperfection and miserable that it was only able to accomplish half of what it was supposed to do, what it had been made to do. After two years of what was perceived to be just a bitter failure, it spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream and said, I am ashamed of myself and I'm sorry. And the water bearer said, why? Why are you sorry? What are you ashamed of? And, and they responded, I have been able for these past two years to deliver only half of my load because of this crack in my side, and it causes all this water to leak out all the way back to your master's house. Because of my flaws, you have to do all this work, you have to do more work, and you don't get the full value from your efforts. And, and the water bearer just feels so sorry for this old and, and cracked pot and says, as we return to the master's house, I want you to look at the beautiful flowers along the path. And, and as they went back up the hill, the old crack pot, you know, notices the flowers and, 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 you know, this cheered it up only for a while until we got back to the master's house and then reality hits and, and you know, there's only half a, a, a pot of water in there for the master and it, you know, Reality sets and uh, the pot apologizes again to the water bearer. And this is what the bearer said to the pot. Did you notice 
that there are flowers only on your side of the path, but not on the other pot side? It's because I've always known about your flaw. And I took advantage of it. I planted flower seeds on your side of the path, and every day while we walk back from the stream, you have watered them. For two years, I've been able to pick these flowers off the side of the path that you've been watering and turned them into my master's house and decorated my master's house with them so he could have this beauty to grace his house. And I feel like most of us see ourselves as this broken pot and we see these things that don't really add up about ourselves. We see these things that we wish were different about ourselves and we start comparing our pots to other people's uh, pots and we, we wish that we had what they had or we, we wish we could do what they could do or we wish that we had the money that they had or whatever it is. We wish that we could be something else and it furthers the notion that we are broken. Today, I want us to begin the process of not looking inward towards our brokenness and our mistakes and seeing our flaws, but looking outward towards a God who shows us time and time again that he uses the things that, he, that we see as broken for beautiful. But before we get into that, I would love if you guys would pray with me uh, just over the passage and over the, the sermon that we're about to, about to dive into together. So, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to, to join in here and worship together and, and, and open up your word and, and just be in your holy house. Lord, we thank you so much that, that you have graced us with your presence here today, Lord, and we ask that, that you remain with us, not just, at the end of, not just to the end of this service, but to the end of this week and forevermore, Lord. We ask that you walk with us, that you be with us, and that you open our hearts today to hear what you have in store for us today, Lord. We love you so much, and everything we do is for you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So there's this guy that I want to talk about today. We are in the series called Role Players, which is a super, super cool uh, uh, sermon series. I see you got the football play up here, which is awesome because I played college football. So I'm a big fan of everything football. And, uh, but this role player that we have here is named Ehud. And you find Ehud's story in Judges chapter 3. But before we can jump straight in to Judges chapter 3, we have to get some background information on what's going on in this story. Because if we don't, a lot of us will be lost, including me. Because this is kind of an ongoing saga of, of events that God is, is putting in motion and the Israelites are putting in motion. So it would only make sense if we go back to almost the very beginning. And what happens in the very beginning is, is uh, God is telling this Israelite nation to go into the promised land. And in the promised land, for it to be solely Israel's, the land of Canaan, you need to drive out all the nations and all the people groups, whether that means uh, war or just asking them nicely, which eventually is war. But you need to drive out these people so the nation can be solely yours. The land is just yours. But the Israelites, they don't do that. They go into this land of, of Canaan, and what they find is that these people aren't so bad. They, they, they don't drive out the people. Whether it was because of fear that this other nation will destroy them if they uh, start this war, or if it's, uh, if it's what they love the customs and the culture of this nation, that they just want to be around them, be with them, kind of be, you know, sister cities or whatever you want to call it. They don't drive out the people, and Israel begins to live with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jezebites, all these other nations with different gods and different morals and different standards of living. And despite... God's graciousness 
for allowing this to happen, Israel begins to sin as a nation. Israel, uh, the most common sin is the adoption of these other gods and other cultures, not making God the number one priority in their lives. They start assuming the cultures of other peoples, and this angers God. They start outright just rebelling, and God says, no more. And as you go forward in the Old Testament, you see this happen over and over and over again. This cycle that just seems to repeat itself, and and Israel will sin, and then God will rise up a nation and kind of take hold of Israel, make Israel's life a little bit tougher. So when we see at the beginning of Judges, we see this nation overcome Israel, and and Israel has to be uh, slaves for many years. This one was 18 years in in Judges chapter 2, and this deliverer that God sends after Israel cries out, like, God, God, please save us, please rescue us from this thing. God sends a warrior named Othniel. And the Israelites are so thankful. They're praising God up and down. And and I don't know how long this lasts, but it, it can't be very long because Israel finds itself in a situation where it's sinning again. And God responds saying, no more. So the Israelites continue to do evil, being influenced by other nations, by other idols. And this is interesting because God commonly punishes the sins of his own people more so than other nations in the Old Testament. Israel's army is weakened, and this nation called Moab is strengthened against them. And the king of the Moabites was this, one of my favorite characters in all the Bible, King Eglon. Now, King Eglon, uh, I'm just Gonna say he's not George Clooney or Brad Pitt. Uh, the Bible is not shy about how fat this guy is. I'm not kidding you. Judges chapter three verses fifteen through twenty seven. This guy is enormous, and I always picture in my head when I'm reading this story, uh, Job of the Hut from the old Star Wars movies. That's that's who I picture in my head when I read about King Eglon. And you guys might think I'm rude, but I promise you, we'll get to the scripture that shows you that this guy is enormous. But not only is this guy big, that's not the only characteristic he has. He also has a personality, and that personality is of a ruthless heathen ruler. And they have the Israelites in captivity. They're slaves, and they cry out to God, God, once more deliver us from this evil, ruthless warrior, this evil king. And like a faithful God, he sends another. And that guy's name is Ehud. And Ehud is an interesting character because Ehud is left-handed. And and I'll explain why uh, this was interesting to him. This is what chapter 3, verse 15 says. This is where we're going to be, Judges chapter 3, verse 15, if you've got the version app on your Bible, or it's probably going to be up on these screens, uh, so you could just follow along with me. This is what it says in the Bible. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which is about a foot and a half, and he strapped it to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he went on their way with those who would carry it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. And the king said to his attendants, 
leave us. And they all left. So he says, I have this secret message for you and approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. And as the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. And this is uh, the gross part. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. This is the Bible. Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And after he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked and said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them, and there they saw their Lord fallen to the floor dead. The Bible can be just so beautiful sometimes. Uh, but I want to get into this story a little bit. I want to kind of just dive right into it. And, and I want to talk about this thing that Ehud had to overcome. He had to overcome his, his setback. He had to overcome uh, what was commonly thought in that time as a disability. See, Ehud was left-handed, which made him unfit for war because in war, you would stand at attention in rows, and everybody had to be the same handedness because you drew your sword from your left hip, and if you were swinging in the same direction as somebody else, somebody else who was a different handedness, it posed a great threat to the people that you were fighting with. And if you could not serve in the army in that time, you were labeled as not a man. The reason why you couldn't fight was called a disability. And you really didn't serve much purpose in this nation. Now, there were other nations that praised left-handed warriors. Sometimes a left-handed warrior was all that a nation sought out because it thought they thought it gave them an advantage in war to be a different hand in this. But in this nation, in this tribe, Ehud was an outcast. But not only was he left-handed, the scriptures say the Hebrew wording of it makes it seem like Ehud had a problem with his left hand. The Hebrew translation says shut of his left hand. So either by uh, an accident or something you know, wrong during birth, what, whatever it was, Ehud could not use his right hand, making him a left-handed person. And we know that when we have things that don't add up about ourselves, when we, have, when we feel like there is something wrong with us, we feel deflated, we feel self-conscious, we feel uh, weak, we're shy. And, and, and this thing could be something that keeps you from dreaming like the biggest uh, audacious dreams that you could think of, these, these big God-sized dreams uh, and how we're unable to fulfill them because we are all broken and we all have uh, cracks in our pot. This could be something that keeps you from thinking you have any use in the kingdom of God. But luckily for us, this is where we need a perfect God to step in and be who he is, which is perfect and all-knowing. Only God knows how to take what seems as a disadvantage and, or a setback, a weakness, whatever you want to call it, and turn that into an advantage. See, Ehud tells King Eglon that I have this secret message from God for you. Now it's interesting what Eglon does here. 
It's really interesting because he's a king, and, and because he's a king, a heathen king, a brutal king, he recognizes God because he stands up. And, and I told you, the Bible is not shy about how big this guy is. Whether it was for a long time, whether he you know, had some trouble standing up, he stands up and recognizes God as his superior so that Ehud could fulfill the prophecy. Not that Egon was in on it, but it's so interesting to me that this heathen king rose out of his seat, whether it was low and easy, whether it was high and stately, he stood up when God was about to speak to him. And, and Ehud gets close to him to tell him the secret. Now, it was a custom in some nations. Uh, this wasn't rule. This wasn't law. This was just a custom where when you would tell a secret of high importance to, to a king, to somebody who's high up in the government, what you would do is the person telling the secret would stand right in front of the secret receiver, that's what we'll call him, and he'll take his right hand, which is your sword-wielding hand, and you'll put it on the shoulder of the person he's telling the secret to. And on the other side... King Eglon, or whoever is receiving the secret, will raise his right hand and put it on the shoulder of the person telling him the secret. Now, this is important. This is a sign of trust. This is a custom that shows you that there is trust here and now for this secret because this could be, you know, this was common in enemies who were trying to, you know, work out differences between kings, between uh, governors, whoever. This was a sign of trust and because Ehud was left-handed, he could easily draw the sword from his right hip and plunge it into the king's heart. God chose Ehud specifically. The guy with the setback, the left-handed man, to be the man of God's victory. God takes the disadvantage in Ehud and turns it into the advantage. And this isn't an uncommon occurrence in the Bible. See, Moses wasn't a good speaker. Gideon was young and weak. Gideon, another guy from the book of Judges. One more, Jephthah, was born illegitimately, kicked out of his house by his brothers. Uh, most of the disciples uh, didn't receive good education. Uh, Paul killed people. The Apostle Paul was part of the regime that was trying to stop Christianity from spreading in the early uh, church days. And what Paul did wasn't pretty. Everybody in the Bible working with some kind of weakness, setback, brokenness, disability, whatever you'll call it. Ehud kills Eglon and the Bible says while they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim and the Israelites went down with him from the hills with him leading them. Ehud says, follow me for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab and allowed no one to cross over. And at that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong, and not one escaped. And that day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. Could you imagine what it would be like to be Ehud in those moments. A young man who was told entire life, his entire life that he could not do things, told his entire life that he could not be things, grew up, was an outcast, reminded every day about his 
setbacks, his, his disability. Could you imagine what it would feel like to blow that trumpet, letting everyone know that Israel was free because of a disabled man? Ehud did not let his setback keep him from fulfilling God's will. And God proves this time and time again that our brokenness does not determine our outcomes. Ehud believed his brokenness could be used. And God desperately wants to show you that he did not screw up when he created you. God wants to use you personally and uniquely for his kingdom. So let me ask you, what is your setback? Where do you find your brokenness? What is that thing that keeps you from pursuing these big, godly, hairy, audacious dreams? We all have our setbacks. We are all broken pots. Uh, Moses leads four million people out of Egypt to the promised land. Gideon becomes one of the greatest leaders and warriors in biblical history. Jephthah turned into a great warrior. The disciples started the early churches. They kept, uh, they kept planning and going out, baptizing Paul becomes one of the most influential people in Christianity, the most influential figures in Christianity. And imagine if their setbacks, their imperfections, hindered them from completing and fulfilling God's will. Do you know what it is when we find ourselves overcoming our setbacks and our disabilities, when we don't have the mindset that we are broken. It's freedom. Freedom to, to know no boundaries. God never sets boundaries for how you can further his kingdom. That's why when I read this super, uh, this super interesting verse, I, I get really excited. And back in verse 27, uh, it says, When he arrived there, that's Ehud, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. And that's super important because this trumpet that he blew, it's called a jubilee trumpet, proclaiming liberty. Not just the liberty of a nation, but the freedom and liberty to know no boundaries. There's an Italian violinist, uh, not to switch the pace up a little bit. There's an Italian violinist uh, back in the early 1800s. Thought by many to have been history's greatest musician. Uh, he swept through Europe in the early 1800s. Uh, the fame that he received for his music was, was nothing short of what Beatlemania was like back in the 60s. Uh, he was famous, and his skills were so great that uh, people thought that he got his ability from the devil. It is said that one evening, this guy named Niccolo Pagini was performing in front of a packed house. As he embarked on the final piece of his, uh, of his music set, the strings on his violin snapped. Just one. But an undeterred Pagini kept playing. A few moments later, the second string snapped. Again, Pagini just kept going. Finished a classical masterpiece on just two strings. Then the unbelievable happened. The third string snapped. And he just kept going. Finishing the piece 
on one string. So brilliant was this performance that the crowd rose to his feet, gave him a standing ovation. But Pagini was not finished. Uh, The encore was to come. And raising his violin above his head, uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to try to do an Italian accent, uh, but he said, Pagini with one string. And with that, the orchestra struck up and Pagini completed this encore on just one string. Pagini was playing these masterpieces, magnificent in every way, uh, using a flawed violin that night. Yet even with three strings broken, the master musician was able to extract beautiful music. You and I are like these flawed instruments in the hands of of God. Yet no matter how flawed and broken, God is still able to weave beautiful, graceful things through us when we give ourselves to serving him and others. Each one of us with our own unique flaws, we are all cracked pots. But if we allow it, the Lord will use our flaws to grace his Father's table. And, and, and I love the way this is, uh, this is written right here. In God's great economy, nothing goes to waste. Don't be afraid of your flaws. Acknowledge them, and, and you too can be the cause of beauty. Know that in our weakness, we find Strength. There is one that is perfect. And uh, no, this wasn't Jeff Bridges. One that became imperfect for us on the cross. And every time we find our brokenness, find our imperfection, find our flaws... Look to the one without. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that we can come here and we can just open your word. Lord, please allow us to be used by your kingdom, Lord. Be with us in our walk, in our journey. Lord, help us to identify these flaws and how we can use them not as problems, not as imperfections, but as uniqueness, uniquely created by you to further your kingdom in any way possible by serving and by loving. Lord, allow us to not see brokenness, but but see opportunity in our uniqueness. Lord, we were not mistakes when you created us because we know that you don't make mistakes. Lord, help us to see that all of us were perfectly made for a purpose and to use that purpose to glorify you and build your kingdom brick by brick. Lord, we love you. And everything that we do is for you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.